Okay, well, we'll get started. So good evening, everyone. And welcome to the fourth and final workshop of Be More Beautiful's Urban Gardening on Vacant Lots virtual workshop series. Oh, a few more people coming in. Um, yeah, so last week we heard an excellent presentation on crop planning and propagation. Um, and if you weren't able to attend last week's class and you want to watch a recording of it, um, I'll be putting the link to our YouTube channel in the chat. So you can see all the videos from our workshops there. Um, so tonight we'll be learning about pollinator gardening from Baltimore City Master Gardener, Michael Andorsky. Um, before I introduce him, there are just a few small housekeeping things I wanted to mention. Um, so as I said in the event email, this presentation is being recorded and will be sent out to all participants after the session ends. Um, while speakers are giving their presentation, um, please remember to mute your microphone and we'll have a short question and answer session after our speaker presents. So please save your questions for them or put them in the chat. Um, cool, so it's my honor to, to introduce you all to Michael Andorsky. He's a retired pediatrician, a Baltimore City Master Gardener, and co-chairman of the Master Gardeners Pollinator Initiative Committee, also known as Pollen. Among its many services and educational activities, Pollen helps install pollinator gardens throughout Baltimore City. Michael studied bees as a volunteer for the U.S. Geological Survey in Beltsville, Maryland. His interest in gardening and bees led him to address the threats facing pollinators, including bees and butterflies, by lecturing on pollinator and pollinator gardening issues to schools and community groups. Um, and thank you so much for being here, Michael, and feel free to take it away. Uh, thank you, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, the Zoom meetings are a little bit weird because you don't get to actually speak to the audience and find out something more about them. But I understand that people who come to these meetings are interested in gardening and possibly pollinator gardening. So here we go. Um, don't bother taking any notes. There's a lot of information here, which is why I gave Morgan lots of handouts which has all the information you'd be taking notes on, it's all already in the handout. So just sit back and enjoy to get a sort of an overview of this. So uh, how to plant a pollinator garden. We, there are two reasons we want pollinator gardens. One is to be, we all want beautiful gardens, but the second thing is we want to do something for the, those who are responsible for the pollinator garden, gardens, namely the pollinators. So there are a few things we need to know. First of all, why do we plant a pollinator garden? Uh, and I've already told you the two main reasons are one to have a beautiful garden, two to help the pollinators. And then once you decide it, before you do a lot of digging, where are you gonna put the pollinator garden so you don't make a mistake and dig it in the wrong place? And how do you prepare the bed for the pollinator garden? Which plants do you use? And once you've decided which plants you use, how do you decide how to display the plants? What's your garden design? And lastly, after you get the plants in the ground, how do you keep things going? So in the next 45 minutes, you are gonna become experts in all of these things. The main reason for planting a pollinator garden as far as the pollinators are concerned is so they can cross pollinate. So cross pollination, is taking pollen from the stamens of the flowers, which is the, the male product. And the pollen looks like this. So if you, let me get, get another uh, pointer on here one second. So it looks like this. So here's a dime and this is pollen. It basically looks like dust. And pollen is carried by pollinators, in this case, the bees, over here to the pistil of the plant and the pollen then goes all the way down into the ovary of the field and combines with the uh, ovule, the, the female part. Nara had a gardening class. The female part and forms a seed like this. And the seed becomes the next generation of flowers. So as far as the bees are concerned, they need the plants for food 
And for their offspring, as far as the flowers are concerned, they need the flowers for the next generation. Okay, so where are you going to put this garden? This is where you're not going to put it. You don't want to put it in the shade. Don't put it next to your house, even though it's right by the windows, if it's too much shade. You should have at least six hours of sun. Let me get this out of the way here. You want at least six hours of sun for a pollinator garden. And to do that, the best place is to have it facing south. Southeast, south, southwest are all fine. And if you have a lot of wind in your property, keep them away from the prevailing wind because the butterflies and the bees aren't very good in wind. Now, how do you prepare the soil once you've gotten the right location? Well, you can do the way this fellow is doing and dig it all up, which works, but it's a lot of work. Or you can smother the things out over here. Now, when you smother it, uh, you can put uh, either plastic or cardboard on top. And if you let that stay there for several months, it looks like this. And then you're ready to use the garden. Oh, what about Roundup? Roundup works great, but don't use it because the manufacturer says that for people who are going to use Roundup a lot, this is how they should dress. And they dress this way because the glycophosphate uh, has been associated with some human cancers. And uh, so as a result, if you're going to use a lot of Roundup, you need to wear a mask and a respirator and be covered from head to toe. And nobody wants to do that. So Roundup works great, but don't use it. Then once you have your lawn smothered, you just churn it up using a rototiller and all of the material goes back into the soil to be used in the future. Uh, you don't need a rotor, you, you could use the green grass and the rototiller, but it's a lot more work uh, than if you've smothered it first. The other way to prepare the soil is, uh, is you may have heard about the lasagna method. The lasagna method is basically making a compost pile in your yard. And you start with layer one, which is cardboard uh, or newspaper, uh, and then layer two, which is a green layer over here. And you go layer after layer, brown layer, which is dry shredded leaves, green layer, which is peat moss manure, vegetable scraps and so forth. Another brown layer up and up and up and up and up until finally you put some fresh compost on the top. This works very well, but it takes a long time to do this. And it's very labor intensive as well. All right. The other way to do this is not to prepare the soil at all, but to weed whack and mulch. So this is a garden that's out, out at the uh, bee station, uh, it, Patuxent uh, bee station. Uh, and the, the keeper of the bees out there wants pollinator gardens, but he has a huge amount of land. And so what he decided to do is cover everything in mulch and then through the mulch, make holes and then put your plants in. Doing this, however, does not keep the weeds down. The weeds after a few years will come up and you still have the weeds, but the plants have, a, have, a head, head, have had a head start. So again, this is not the recommended way to do it, but it's a fast and easy way to uh, get a pollinator garden down. You just get, so you, and you get from the city some free um, sawdust or, or trimmings from trees and use that. The other way is buy the soil. So if you have raised beds, you buy the soil. If you buy your soil, it should be a third topsoil, a third peat or coarse sand to allow good drainage, and a third compost uh, so all the nutrients are there. So these are all the ways you can prepare the soil. Now, if you're using the soil you have, you want to make sure it's, it's adequate. So the native plants that you're going to be using are really very good in all sorts of soil, but they can only withstand so much. So you can't have perfectly clay soil. Oops, wrong button. So this is a lump of clay. If you squeeze a lump of clay, you can make a ribbon out of it as you squeeze the water out of it. And if you can make that ribbon two inches long or longer, it's too much clay. You've got to add some amendments to it. On the other hand, 
you may have soil is too sandy. If it's too sandy and you put the sand in your hand, it won't make a ribbon at all. So you want something that makes a little bit of a ribbon, but not two inches of a ribbon. And that's the, that's the fast way of knowing if your soil is going to be okay. Whichever soil you use before you do your planting, it's a good thing to add two inches of compost to it. Or you can just put a, a shovel full of compost into each planting hole. If you wanna figure out how much compost you need, if you have a rectangular garden, you just take the length times the width of the garden in feet times two inches, which is two twelfths of a foot. And that lets you know how much compost you need to buy from uh, Lowe's or Home Depot, or wherever you're gonna be buying your compost if you don't have your own. If you have a circular garden, you use, as we all learned in high school, pi r squared for the area of a circle times two twelfths. And that's how to know how much compost you need because it's always a shock when you go to the store and see how much money you've already spent on it if you haven't figured this out in advance. Okay, so we know what we want. We want a beautiful garden, but what do the pollinators want? They want 75% of that garden to be native plants. What's a native plant? A native plant has been a plant that's been in America longer than the pilgrims have been here. If the pilgrims introduced it, it's not native. That's a simple definition of a native plant. The reason for native plants is that different pollinators have different needs. And many pollinators are very picky about using only native plants. So that's why you want to use them. The other thing is that many of the plants that are available that are not native, that have been hybridized, since they're hybridized for the purpose of making them look beautiful, the people that are hybridizing them have already, have all, uh, often hybridize all the nectar out of the plants. So lots of hybridized plants are very low in nectar, which is not good for the uh, pollinators. So you want a garden with 75% native plants and 25% uh, non-natives, which we'll talk about in a little bit. When you plant, you need a variety of plants. You need a variety because different bees and, and butterflies like different things. Some will eat anything and some won't. We have over 400 different species of native bees in Maryland alone, and some of them are very picky. Secondly, you want to put the plants in drifts, not just one plant here, another species there, another species in the third place, but a whole drift of plants because the bees, and uh, especially the bees, like to stick with one plant type at a time when they go from, when they go from plant to plant. So you're planting drifts. Then you have to make sure you have a constant bloom because many native plants will only bloom for two weeks, sometimes up to a month. So you have to figure out how you can have a garden that's gonna bloom all the way from early spring until late fall. So 75% native plants, plant a variety of plants in drifts and make sure you have a constant bloom that goes from early spring to fall. Lastly, you don't want to use wood mulch if possible. And the reason for that is that wood mulch is something that the bees can't get through to form colonies under the ground. But they can form colonies with living mulch. What is living mulch? Living mulch is, is simply uh, green, low-growing plants. So if you get your garden with lots of green, low-growing plants in between the tall ones, You'll have a garden that's easy to upkeep and you won't have to use much mulch. All right, which plants for the pollinator garden? I put all of these on here at once just to show you that, that there's a huge number of plants you can choose from. It's not difficult finding the plants. You have native perennials. You have non-native perennials. You have annuals, spring bulbs, herbs, and all sorts of ground covers are all good things for pollinator gardens. And we're gonna go into these now. First, what is it that you do not want to plant? Well, these are beautiful plants. This is a beautiful dahlia. It's a beautiful rose. And it's a beautiful impatience. But these are not good for pollinator gardens. Why are they not good for pollinator gardens? because the bees and the butterflies can't get to the stamens where the pollen is, 
and they can't get to the pistols to deliver the stamens and find the nectar because they're all closed. These are all doubly petaled plants. So these are not good for pollinator gardens. It's easier to tell you what's not good than what is good. Makes it a lot easier. However, here's a dolly that is good. It's an open dolly. You can see the pistil and the stamens right in the middle. Here are impatiens. And here are roses. By the way, you see these little lines that go up away from the plants? These little white ones over here and the red ones over here. Now I know that you think and I think that they were here to make them beautiful so we could appreciate them. But that's not why they're here. They're, these are called nectar guides. And it's a way of the plant telling the bee the direction he should go or she should go to get to the pistil in the center. And even this plant, if you were, uh, if you were a bee and you had ultra, ultra, uh, violet, uh, ultra, ultraviolet range is what you could see, this would actually show nectar guides as well. And another lecture I have is showing nectar guides in here, but that's for another time. Okay, so what are some of the native perennials? Well, here's wild indigo, which comes up very early. It's a very beautiful plant, it's easy to grow. Here's a bumblebee going after the wild indigo. This is a purple one, this is a white one. Here's ragwort, this is another early one. And these are actually wasps that are coming to this plant. And this also comes in very early in the spring. Here's another early one, wild geranium which is also a low plant, so it's good for a ground cover. And this is called osmia, which is also known as the mason bee, which likes to come out in early spring, which loves this plant. Okay, here are more early plants. Virginia bluebells, spiderwort. And then we have mid-season plants, like early May to mid-June, and all the milkweeds are mid-season plants. This one's called a Sclepius tuberosa, which is a very pretty orange plant. There are four different kinds of milkweeds you can buy, purchase in Maryland. And these little guys are caterpillars for the monarch butterfly because the monarch butterfly likes these plants, forms the caterpillars on them, and will form another generation of monarch butterflies for you. Okay, more mid-season plants. These are Monarda, which are also very nice because the deer don't like them. And this is mountain mint. Mountain mint isn't very showy, but the bees love it because this is the highest nectar plant of all the plants. So the bees have a field day with this one. It also makes, if you're cutting your flowers, this is a nice filler for in between all of the cut flowers. Here's some more mid-season plants. This is yarrow. And uh, this one shows several. This is Rutabecchia and Saldego, which is goldenrod, Echinacea, Agastache. All these are mid-season. Now, how about the late plants? These are New England asters. Here's Saldego again, which used to be considered a weed until the British decided it was a flower. And now the Americans all think it's a flower as well. But you can find this even growing in uh, in vacant lots and on the highways because it wasn't one time a weed. And here's some more late, more late ones, thoroughwort and Joe Pieweed. Uh, now, what about non-native perennials? These are non-native, so this is among the 25% of the plants you put in the garden. You have globe thistles, you have gallardia, you have butterfly bush, except you shouldn't have butterfly bush. Why? Because butterfly bush, although it sounds as if it, it's intended for butterflies, is an invasive plant that takes over the garden. They make a few species now that are supposedly not invasive, but in general, if it's called butterfly bush or bedelia, avoid it. Daisies are fine to use. Okay, here are more non-native perennials. This is sedum. And here are annuals, cardinal vine and cosmos, nicotinia, nasturtium, lantana, zinnia. 
easy to grow, uh, and the deer don't like it, and the bees love it, and it comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes. It's terrific for pollinator gardens. Pentis. And then we get to the spring bulbs. Glory of the snow and snowdrops and winter aconite and allium. Crocuses are good for pollinators. Hyacinths and water lily tulips. Muscari, Siberian squill, bluebell and wood anemone. Now I have, I'm just showing you all these to show you what a variety there is. And on one of the handouts you have, all of these are listed with their times of bloom and their heights and so forth. You can also uh, make sure that you have some herbs that are very good for butterfly caterpillars, namely parsley and dill and fennel. Herbs are also in the, uh, very flowery, in, uh, such as borage and pineapple sage. And for living mulch, for low growing plants, uh, you buy creeping flocks or thyme, or this plant called pussyfoot is another thyme, and sweet woodruff, which is not native, uh, but uh, the many bees and butterflies seem to go after it quite well. Then there are grasses, little blue stem, bottle brush sedge, and this very short one called blue-eyed grass, all of which make very good uh, ground covers. These are taller, these are not good ground covers because they're very tall, but muley grass and lemongrass are very effective as well, especially in the back of the garden. All right, so that was just to give you a brief overview of all of the different kinds of plants there are. So just to know it's easy to find what you need to get. Now we have to come to the point of garden design. What do you do about the plants? So here's this wife telling her husband, how are you arranging your plants? By color? No, here's another way. He's arranging them by alphabetical order. So I guess that's one way of doing it, but it would be a very weird garden if you did it by alphabetical order. So here are some other tips besides alphabetical order. First, you deal with a focal point. Somewhere in that garden of plants, there has to be something that the eye is drawn to. In this case, it's this wooden chair. Or it could be a stone pathway. In this case, there's a few things. There's a stone pathway and a wooden chair, as well as a couple of containers. So containers, wooden chairs, pathways, things that are non-plant often work as good focal points and attract the eye to it. The bees could care less if it's a focal point, but your neighbors will love your garden because of the focal point. Here's an example of a tree as a focal point. So it's something that's organic. And here's a tree as a focal point, a rock and a chair, all serving as focal points. In this garden, I think the focal points uh, outnumber the plants, as a matter of fact. You could do with a few more plants than this person's put in the garden. Or you can put a little statues or statuettes in the garden. Something to track the eye. Second is theme. Theme is a group of plants that go from one end of the garden to the other. So it'll draw your eye from one end of the garden to the other as you look at the garden. It's, uh, it's not necessary for the pollinators, but again, your neighbors will think it's really cool because there seems to be some continuity to it. So you need a theme. So here, for example, is a garden. So where is the theme in this? So if you look at this, you'll see these yellow flowers here, which are Rebecca, and they all have these big fat centers, the pistils with the stamens. And then it goes to the daisies over here, and they're the same way. They have these big fat centers. So that's where the theme is. Your eye is drawn because of the type of flower you're looking at. Here's another example of a theme. So my eye is drawn to the white. I see the white of this echinacea, and over here, and over there. So your eye is drawn from the beginning to the end of the garden with everything else filling it in. Okay, where's the theme in this one? Well, to my eye, it's this high 
grass. And the other grass, and although you can't see it, it happens to be right behind Morgan's face right now on my screen, but it's off, the, if you, it's off your screen. There's, an, there's another tall grass as well. So tall grasses make, can make a theme as well. Okay, here's, a, here's something with a focal point, but I don't see much of a theme here. To me, this is a very boring garden. This looks more like a vegetable garden. Uh, there's nothing that makes my eye want to go from one end to the other of this. So I would not recommend a garden like this, but again, as far as the bees are concerned and the butterflies, they're happy with it. All right, now, how do you get your garden from the plants you want to put in it onto a piece of paper? You actually can buy software that helps you do this, but the way that I do it and most gardens do it is just by using graph paper. So you plot out your graph. So this was a 20 foot by 10 foot space. And then you go to the second graph and you plot out very coarsely your theme. What plants you're gonna put that are gonna extend from one side to the other, okay? And then you go to number three, which is all the other plants. Plants here, plants there, plants there, okay? And here and here. Now you gotta fill them in and figure out what you wanna put where. So here's one example. And in the front, if it's a, a rectangular garden, so you're only looking at it from the front, you put the short plants in front and you put the tall plants in the back, like the goldenrod and the Joe pie weed in the back, okay? And then you go ahead and you label all of these plants. First, you lay the theme and you put a little dot for each plant. You put each plant two feet away from each other, two feet away from each other. And then you put a focus somewhere. So I'm putting the focus right there. Okay, that can be your, your old chair, a couple of rocks, uh, an old wheelbarrow that's painted a bright color, whatever you want for a focus right there. And then make sure these are planted two feet apart. And then if you wanna know how many plants you have, you can just add up all the dots. In addition, after you plant this, in between these two plants, every foot, you put another plant, which is the low growing plant. So that can get quite expensive. So what I do at the beginning is, I'll put a little bit of mulch around the outside and I'll just put some of these plants on the inside, some of these low growing plants. And as the years go by, you keep dividing them and spreading them around your garden. So that's one way of how to get your idea to a piece of paper. So here are some other pollinator gardens that people have put together. So if you look at this one, the F plant here is the white false indigo. This is a small plant, and this acts as the focus. Why? Because it's the tallest one and it's, it's white. And this uh, acts as a focus when this plant is no longer blooming. Why? Because it's the location that the eye is drawn to, namely a corner of the garden. And the front, which has all the low growing plants, is what draws your eye from one end to the other, and then use the same plant on either end. In this case, they're using butterfly milkweed, the orange milkweed I showed you earlier. Here's another one, another garden layout. All right, so here's the focus. Why is this the focus? This is a hydrangea, so this is a shrub. So this shrub is a lot bigger than anything else in this garden and it lasts all spring and all summer into the fall, so it catches your eye as the focus. So what about a um, theme? Well, in the back, they have these pillars, which are uh, listed in this, as li li being in this guy's garden. And in addition, they use these grasses in the front, the lemongrass, muley grass, muley grass, another grass, and all these grasses form something that the eye can follow. So that's an example of another thing. Here are the grasses again. This is what the grasses look like when they're in bloom. All right, here's another garden. So 
where's the focus in this one? Well, it's obvious it's this little guy's patio over here, right? All right, well, that's a focus. What about um, a theme? There's not much of a theme in this one, except he has two bushes that are pretty much the same size and look the same on either side. And so in this small garden, I think this is acting as, the, as his theme. But in addition, he has all these shrubs in the back, which also act as a theme. So I'm pretty sure that's what this person was thinking of when he put this together. Okay, here's another example of a garden. Well, let's see. Well, you have all the grasses in the back mixed in with purple cone flower, which are very tall. So that acts as something to draw your eye from one side to the other. And I don't think he decided where to put a, um, uh, a focus on this. No. All right. And here's a very small garden. So the bird bath is the focus and it's very small. So he uses a, a rutabecki over here and another one over there. And that sort of draws the eye from one side to the other. So there are all sorts of ways of doing this. Let's look at this one. Here's the bird bath for your focus. And in the front, he has all the lavender, which is low and, uh, and is forms some continuity. So focus in Thebe, plant and drifts, not just one flower here and one flower there. Here's an interesting garden because it's made up only of, uh, except for the foxgloves, it's made up mostly of herbs. And the focus here, of course, is the chair. And your eye is drawn by the way he has stuff going along these paths here. See this? Right along the paths. That's sort of the, the eye for these flowers, which are not particularly showy. There. So it goes from there to there, all the way to there, and so forth. All right. Here's another one, another pollinator garden that has nothing but herbs in it. So if you grow a garden like this, you need something to for focus. So uh, he uses his lemongrass as the focus in the back because it's the tallest. And then he uses zinnias. These are zinnias, these are zinnias, these are zinnias, all annuals. And that draws the eye around to give the, eye, to give the garden a little bit of symmetry. All right, how many plants do you need? So the easiest way to know is once you have your, your diagram set up, just count the numbers. But sometimes you'd like to know in advance before you start doing all of that work. So the rule of thumb is you plant the specimen plants, the tall plants two feet apart and the ground cover in between. So let's start with the specimen plants. If you have a rectangular garden, length times width times 0.25, one quarter, is how many specimen plants you need, roughly. So when I go out to help people with gardens and they ask me this question before I can get it on a piece of paper, I can give them the answer right away and they think it's magic. Now for a circular garden, it's not quite so easy. So I have this diagram, and I think this is one of the handouts I gave you, which shows the diameter of the garden along this x-axis and the number of plants you need along the y-axis. So if you have a sort of circular garden that's about 20 feet diameter, you're going to need about 70 plants. If you had a 30 foot diameter garden, you're going to need about 140 specimen plants. So that's a fast way of figuring it out, but counting the dots works quite well also. Okay, this is a summary and this is the handout that you've all received also. Location, make sure you're facing south. Sun, at least six hours. Make sure the soil is at least two to four percent organic. So you add compost is the easiest way to do it. You don't have to add the fertilizer. Okay, make sure you have 75% natives, 25% non-natives are fine. Try to use as little mulch as you can. Use low growing plants for the mulch. And it's nice to be able to provide a water source nearby and nesting options for the pollinators. And the biggest nesting option for the pollinators is, is no mulch. So what do you need to do to maintain this garden? Do you need fertilizer? No. Do you need mulch? 
No. Do you need blood and bone meal? No. Do you need gypsum? No. The only thing you need is compost. You can make your own or you can buy it at the store such as Leaf Grow, and that performs all the organic matter that you need. What about watering it, right? Well, don't overdo it the way this guy is. Watering is important, but not too much. The garden for the first two years needs one to two inches a week, naturally or by hand. Once it's established after two weeks, it is pretty well on its own. Of course, if your garden is like my garden, you keep adding things to it. So you're always in the one to two year cycle because there are new plants there. What about weeding the garden? If, if the native plants like to grow there, certainly weeds would like to grow there also. Well, here's one solution. Uh, but I have not been able to find a goat that will only eat weeds. That's the problem. Or you can actually mow the weeds down, but that doesn't work out very well because you mow too much of the, the good stuff down. So this is the real work of these gardens once they're established. That's the way you get rid of the weeds. But do it with a smile on your face. I usually have a glass of scotch in one hand. It makes it easier. All right, summertime comes. It's time to prune and time to deadhead. Some plants are such uh, need to be the flowers need to be removed quickly if you want new flowers to come back. Um, and in addition, uh, some pruning needs to be done. But don't overdo the pruning. Okay, the main reason for pruning is for the native plants is so they won't grow too tall. But if you don't care about your minority being very tall, as I don't, just let them grow as they naturally will. If you want them to be a little bit shorter, prune them back early in the summer so they won't get too tall later in the summer. What do you do in the fall? Well, my philosophy is this guy's philosophy. Leaving the old seed head on is doubly satisfying because it shows one's a sophisticated gardener and it means you have less gardening to do. Why are you sophisticated? Because those, those stems provide habitat for the bees and some butterflies for the following spring. And the following spring comes, you cut them back to about 80, 18 inches high. And any bees that are, uh, that are in there still will get, have room to get out. And the new plants just grow up right amongst the old, the old stems. So it works out quite well. All right, then comes the following spring and you start all over again. Uh, you usually don't need any, any more compost the following spring, but you do have to do a lot of weeding. You have to see which plants are starting to overtake other plants in your garden and, and edit them and transplant them around. And your garden will start to look a lot different as the years go on because it's a growing living thing. Okay, so in summary, why do we plant a garden? We plant it, one, to make it beautiful and two, to have a source of habitat and food for pollinators. Two, location is important. It needs at least six hours of sun a day and out of a, it needs to be out of a lot of wind. Three, you got to prepare the bed appropriately and we talked about that. You can smother it, you can dig it up, you can plant on top of it using a lasagna method or if you're using raised beds, you can import the soil from elsewhere. You have to decide which plants to use and you have handouts to show you which plants to use, which seasons they grow, how tall they grow, what their needs are. Then you have to plan with garden design. The easiest garden design is if it's rectangular, the short plants in front, the tall ones in the back, have a focal point and have a theme. In terms of maintenance, the first two years are the toughest. The biggest problem with maintenance will be getting the weeds out and watching which natives are overgrowing and you wanna exchange some of them with your neighbors and move them out of your garden to other gardens. And that's it. That's how to plant a pollinator garden. And if you do that, you'll have a place for all of the bees, all the butterflies, all the hummingbirds, and your neighbors will love it because it'll be something beautiful. So if you need some help with gardens, uh, 
uh, pollen both of the Baltimore Master Gardeners, we're here to help people do gardening. And if it's a community garden, we can do a lot for you, all the way from garden design to helping bring people out to get down in the dirt with you to get, give you whatever advice you need. Uh, if it's a, your own private garden in the backyard and you just want a one-time consultation, we're available for that also. And you can reach me at this email address, and that's it. Okay, now I'm uh, turning it back over to you, Morgan. Thank you so much, Michael, for that wonderful presentation. That was really beautiful. Um, yeah, so we'll have a little question and answer session now. Um, so anyone who has a question, feel free to unmute yourself or um, put your question yeah, in the I chat. Wanna, I wanna get my, this, I wanna stop my, uh, get my screen off. How do I do that? Stop share, I guess. Bingo, there we go. Okay, now I'm with you. I have a question. Hello. Yes, um, I'm not starting from plants. I am actually starting from seed. Uh, so how, how uh, different? Okay, so if you're starting from seed, starting natives from seed is very difficult because it often takes a couple of years for them to grow into a plant, okay? You can do it from seed. Uh, if you start it in the winter by taking seeds and uh, very early, very late in the winter, putting them into um, soil in, indoors. Uh, but what I would suggest you do is you get a few plants to start out with, um, and then you can plant a lot of annuals, such as zinnias. Uh, so the first year you'll have more annuals than you want, but they only come up every year and you can keep replacing them with more plants, more seeds later on that, you, that you've grown. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm using, well, the seeds I have, I have sunflowers, borage, um, nasturtiums, and... Um, well, the nasturtiums are fine. Sunflowers are the two basic kinds. There are perennial sunflowers and annuals. The annuals come up right away. The perennials, I think, take a longer time to come up. Yeah, I, so what I did was I collected my seeds from last year, yeah. from my sunflowers, as well as I... I I have an abundance of seeds because I kept buying seeds. Did you stratify them over the winter? Did you give them a cold treatment with moisture in the refrigerator? Well, actually, I stored them in, I have an old lunchbox. So I stored them in a lunchbox. Gene, try it. I mean, the ideal way is you take those seeds. This is a whole other lecture. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is you take the seeds and you have to do something called stratifying. And you mm -hmm. can look this up online. Stratify, it's T-R-A-T-I-F-Y. And that gives them a cold treatment that they that they would otherwise get outdoors in your garden over the winter. Okay. Um, but read about that because that's the way to do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. Any other questions? Okay. Morgan, back over to you. No other questions, I think. Okay, cool. Um, I know, I think Jean, oh, well, you just asked a question, Jean, about um, like throwing away bamboo and sunflower well, stalks and how there's like potentially bees in there. I did read something about that earlier this right, week. I feel bad, throw away my bamboo stalk and sunflower stalks. I need to go back and pull them. There might be bees in there. Okay. So this, again, this is a third lecture, but they, there's a, a whole talk about, um, about how to provide bee habitat including how to make bee hotels. The natural way, of course, is for the bees to live in stems. They live in stems that are between 3 sixteenths and 5 sixteenths of, of diameter. And so uh, the next time, if you cut down your bamboo, don't throw it away, cut it up, and you can use it yourself in, in a bee hotel you can make and put it out in the spring and the bees will go to it. Um, regarding your sunflower stalks, and if it's short bamboo, you leave, if you leave that in the garden, the bees will find it and they will, will put their eggs into it, and then they'll fly away in the spring. 
There are only two kinds of bees that like to live in stalks. One is the mason bee and the other is the leaf cutter bee. They both come out early, but they don't last long. Bumblebees live on the ground, usually in mice nests. And most of the other bees live under the ground. Um, but the, those two, the leaf cutters and the mason bees, like to live in stalks. Uh, I have another question. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure, but um, do mason bees move into your shed? Because last year, I had a bunch of bees that uh, hung around my shed, and my shed is made out of wood. So I'm that, that wasn't, I, I doubt that's mason bees, unless you have a very interesting shed. It was probably carpenter bees. Okay, all right. Okay, so I have carpenter bees also. For some reason, they don't touch my shed. They touch my compost heap. They live in the wood at the bottom of the compost heap, which is fine with me because they're not destroying anything that I need. But if they're destroying your shed, then you have to do something about that, right? But it's not the mason bees. Okay, Morgan. Any more questions, anyone? I, can, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, so I, um, I've been having a, a back and forth with my wife. She, she wants to, we have trumpet vine in the backyard, which of course is invasive. She, she would like to just get rid of it. Um, I'd like to find some way, it, it was kind of growing up into all over our garage, which, uh, but I just wanted to see if there's a way that I could put it someplace where it's not going to be a problem. And what, and also just what, you didn't mention anything about trumpet, but I wondered if you thought that was a good thing to have back there anyway. Well, I, I don't know. Let me ask you a question because yes. I'm not acquainted with it. Do, do you see bees and butterflies coming to this trumpet vine? Uh, well, so lately, they have, so one thing, there's a lot of shade in the backyard too. And, and so it, it and, and where it was growing on the garage, it was, it was pretty shaded out. So it wasn't really, uh, it wasn't even flowering. It was just, it was just this kind of woody vine. I, I mean, hummingbirds are, it's, they call it hummingbird vine and hummingbirds usually attracted to it. Right. I, uh, uh, so the, the answer is, as far as I know, that is not a good pollinator vine. Okay what to do with it because this is an old friend and you don't want to get rid of her. <laughs> um, put it somewhere near your patio. Okay, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. And, and for your, and, and, and to make your wife happy over <laughs> your shed, you grow some tall things like cosmos or moonflower. Yeah. Oh, we have a lot of moonflowers. She, she likes moonflowers. So yes. She likes moonflowers. <laughs> That'll do fine. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. And I guess another thing too um, about mason bees. I have a couple of mason bee houses. I had heard uh, I'd read someplace that, may, that there was some controversy with those. That sometimes uh, uh, the, or, you have to be careful how how you hang them or what, what you do with them. That sometimes predators will get into them, and, and it's and it's maybe yeah, all, not all those all those things are true. Okay. So, okay. So for example, in my the first mason bee house that I hung up, the the, the the birds knocked all the tubes out and put a bird's nest into it. Mm, wow. <laughs> in addition to that, there are a lot of uh, fungi and uh, parasites that can get into these nests. Okay. Uh, so it all depends what kind of your mason bee house that you have. What do you have? Do you have tubes in it or is it drilled wood? Uh, there's, there's tubes in it. There's, there's, I have two different ones, two different right. kinds. They both have well, tubes. Yeah. All right. What are the tubes made of? Uh, they seem almost like they look kind of like bamboo, kind of like little little bits okay, of bamboo. So these right. are some of the things that people talk about. Mm -hmm. Tubes are good, bamboo is not. Okay. Why is bamboo not good? It's because it's not porous. So if it gets uh, from the inside, it can't. It, the dampness can't leave. Okay. So the best kind of tubes are cardboard tubes, which you can buy online, mm -hmm. uh, or you can buy paper straws online really cheaply. Yeah. Which are about five sixteenths of an inch diameter, and those work as well. But there okay. are a lot of places, including Amazon, but not, a, not just Amazon, where you can buy the tubes. The second thing is where to put it. It needs to be about four feet above the ground. Okay. To prevent the parasites and so forth, some people, and I've not done this before, but I'm going to do it this year, mm -hmm. will take the tubes out every winter, wow. bring it inside, take the cocoons out, 
wash them off in a mixture of water and uh, uh, alcohol or water and, and some detergent, then clean them off with plain water, dry them off, put them in a plastic box and leave them in the refrigerator and then take the plastic box and put it out near your bee nest in the early spring and they'll take off. Wow. That's a lot of work. And I asked the bee expert at Sam Drogi about this. He says, look, do we really have to do all this? Mother Nature doesn't do this. No. He says, you're right, Mother Nature doesn't, but it's a lot better for the parasites. Now, how often will you get parasites? So there have been a couple of studies that show that you'll lose about 20% of your population of, of uh, bees to the parasites mm. uh, each year. Okay. But if you change the tubes every year, you won't do that as, as much. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, any more questions? Okay, going once, going twice. All right, well, you can definitely follow up with Michael if any questions arise. Um, cool, well, thank you so much everyone for coming out tonight. Um, and thank you again, Michael, for your incredible presentation. Um, so I'll be sending a follow-up email tomorrow with the recording of this presentation. Um, and so we'll actually be having um, another gardening workshop series. This is the last in our um, Urban Gardening on Vacant Lots series for the spring. We'll be having another one in the summertime. Um, so look out for an email about that in early May from me. Um, and also, yeah, just feel free to, to reach out to me if you have any questions, if you want uh, the contact info of the presenters, if you missed that or um, anything else, I am here. And yeah, thanks again, everyone, for coming and have a beautiful rest of your night. Bye-bye.